All right, in this video, we have Dan Info, Don Higgins, and Jeff Scher just talking about how to make the most out of your rut this November. We hope you guys enjoy it. A lot of great clips from past conversations. Let's get right into it. Another question uh, from Death Row by Bo on Instagram. He said, uh, when deer change from feeding patterns to breeding, what is your preferred camera location? So I guess, where are you putting the cameras during the rut when I guess those traditional feeding patterns change? I would have them by doe bedding um, or on travel routes. Um, travel routes are good, but uh, travel routes, sometimes you can get those ones that are going for long distances. Um, most of the um, mature bucks I shoot during uh, rut are coming off of uh, buck bedding areas that are adjacent to doe bedding areas. They seem to hole up in them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's something I came into just not too long ago, like uh, in the last four or five years, as I started learning that bucks have specific, uh, uh, mature bucks have specific rut beds um, where they're not running around with those other bucks like crazy chasing. That's not to say they don't get up and wander too. I mean, yeah. you could look at uh, telemetry and, and see that, but you also see that they lock up in spots. And what I'm finding is you find these bedding areas that uh, there ain't much of a bed and you can hardly see it, but all the trees around it are rubbed. And they're like tore up like crazy. So you know that that buck spent a short time period bedding there, but was very agitated to rub all those trees. And then I'm finding that those spots are generally looking at the op uh, like the exit from a doe bedding area, or they're just downwind of it. And we started hunting those. We've been having a lot of action watching those bucks. They're holing up next to those does because like we know, those mature bucks don't want to wander around in daylight, but they still want to be in on the breeding. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're guarding their does from the younger bucks. Uh, roughly, what are some dates for the Midwest to where you have been seeing them spend the, the most time in those rut beds? Uh, for me, it's been um, probably that last week of October, first week of November. Um, and you get into the second week of November, they, they get a little bit more... Uh, it still works, but they get a little more uh, unpredictable. Mm -hmm. um, where they're predictable and uh, still sticking to patterns pretty much in that early rut. Mm -hmm. You know, there's one really interesting thing that I, I wrote about at North American Whitetail. Um, I think it was in 2015 that uh, not many people caught caught it when I said it. It didn't catch on like... You know the same. I did the article same time, same place back in 2003, and that, and and that uh, quirk and a deer's uh, habits seem to catch on. So now a lot of people talk about catching a buck in the same place at the same time every year. But the the other thing I noticed that I wrote about in 2015 that the title of the uh, article was homecoming bucks, and uh, what I noticed is that these bucks that that shift their range in the fall. They have a summer, a, a definite summer range, and then they have a different fall winter range. And what I noticed is that these bucks uh, that, that shift their range at the very beginning of the rut, they will a lot of times make a journey back to where they summered or at the very tail end of the rut, they'll make a journey back to where they summered. And my theory is that these bucks relocate early in the fall. They've got their home range, they stay there. As the rut starts to heat up, they can't find a hot doe at home, and they're really anxious to get that first hot doe. So they they get so anxious, they run back home to where they spent the summer, and they look for it there. I mean, I've got example after example, and I was showing some of those in my seminar that I did here earlier today, that uh, the, these bucks, are, it's around, say, November 5th to about the 7th or so, right before them does are coming in heat. I see these bucks, these mature bucks that have relocated, run back to where they spent their summer. And then right at the very, the last three or four days of November, the first two or three days of December, they'll do the same thing. Sometimes the same buckle yeah. will do both. A lot of times I don't catch them uh, both doing it early and late. And I think a lot of it is just tied to whether they can find a hot doe at home or not. If they can, they stay there. But uh, if not, they run back to where they spent their summer. Do you run a lot of cameras or, let me ask you this. In late October, over scrapes, is there any tendencies or anything that you see um, as far as daylight activity on certain days or that that first cold front towards the end of October? Is, is there any data points that you've seen over the years in that time frame? Well, what I've noticed more than anything is uh, 
we, we try to be too, uh, I don't know, specific uh, as deer hunters, uh, trying to simplify things. And, and sometimes in the process, we end up complicating things and make it a lot harder than, than it really is or a lot more complicated than it really is. Uh, and I, I've said for years that weather trumps all. Weather trumps the moon. Weather trumps everything. Um, so, you know, I, I hear a lot of guys talking about how great Halloween week is, how, how great the last week of October is. And I've never, ever seen that ex unless that last week is there's a cold front comes mm -hmm. through. If it's normal, I, I don't see that kind of activity these guys talk about. Or if it's above normal, I certainly don't see it. But even when the conditions are normal for the last week of October, I don't see the activity that some guys claim they do. Mm -hmm. And I think that what happens is they'll see, uh, we'll get a cold front come through and they'll see some good activity and they'll just assume it's like that every year. Yeah. And it's not if that cold front doesn't happen at that time. Well, and that's that's something that I've seen this year. We had a good cold front come towards the end of October. Uh -huh. Many other years, we did not have that like you're mentioning. And um, I could see where, I mean, people get, we talk about people getting romantic, people kind of, Everyone that carves out like their own secret sauce of, you know, this is what works. And I think that's mm -hmm. could be a big part of it. Now there's such a complexity for how you hunt that, how you spend your time wisely. Um, but really the timing of the rut takes place at the same time every single year in your area. The weather, the moon does, it has no influence over the actual timing of the breeding window. And there's been many studies to show that all across the board. And uh, I remember uh, John Azoga set me straight. He's a deer research um, biologist. Uh, he has been. He's retired from the state of Michigan now for at least 12, 15 years. Um, and they had ultrasounded hundreds, if not a couple thousand does over a couple decades. And they found by ultrasounding those does and finding when the date of conception based on the embryo size, embryo size, that they could actually look back and say this was the date of the conception within a day. And they found out over a 25-year period, 30-year, 20 years, a long, long time, and that there was no influence on the timing of the rut by any factor at, at all. It was the same. And so I, let's say I think the, the date might have been the 13th and that 80% of the deer were bred within a week on either side of that in the UP where a rut is more defined. Um, the further south you go, you can have deer that breed. And, you know, up there, if the fawns are born early, they die. If they're born, born late, they die. But the bottom line is they could compare that to moon phases, bad weathers, bad weather years, good weather years. And, and the, the timing was not influenced at all. Um, and so, and, and, and that's only one study. That was back in, he set me straight, I think that was 99, 2000, somewhere on there. And, and so if you take that knowledge in that experience and you apply it to this year's rut and you apply it to every year's rut and you mix in the complexity of non-core bucks that don't live on your land bucks that do live on your land it helps to explain a lot what you're seeing in the woods every year and that's why i like it it's something you can depend on and and if you follow that it really sets your strategy up and it gets you to a higher level of success pretty quickly would you say when is the best quote-unquote activity um, from what you've seen with knowing November 13th roughly is when most of those are being bred. Would you say 48 hours before that um, is typically, once again, depending on weather, but w how long is that seeking phase or when that seeking phase is most intense in correlation to a, a November 13th being the majority of the does actually being bred? And, that, and that's really tough because you're looking at that November 13th. That's when a, that's that peak time but mm -hmm. you're going to look at 10 days before then where you're really starting to have a lot of does beginning beginning to come in estrus mm -hmm. because there's you know three times more does than bucks or whatever the number is two and a half then most bucks get a get a doe during that time but that time if you if you go 10 days back from that peak which i think is a really important date mm -hmm. Because I feel that's that three or four day window where almost every buck is getting a doe because they're all starting to become, they're coming into heat, they're coming into estrus. And it's actually 201 days. So I was yeah. my dyslexic <laughs> thinking. <laughs> but <laughs> but anyways, we were closer. I think we were. I think we were right in the middle. But yeah. anyways, um, the uh, that period of time is what I consider the lockdown phase, mm -hmm. where 
every buck's getting a doe and it, in, in that period of time might be the eighth or ninth in southern ohio southern Illinois, so, southern india um but that lockdown phase is really true because that's a period where they're not hitting scrapes anymore because they're pract they're really focusing more on breeding and um so that to me is a really important window if you just go back about 10 days now you can throw that all out the window when you go down south georgia alabama florida where they have the extended rot you know again those fawns can be born in july or august and they're still going to be viable fawns going through hunting season make it in, in, in unless predators get them so a little bit tighter up here and mm -hmm. you know the north half of the white tail states 